Right, as you already correctly said, this is a joint work with Masoud Mahfouz Khatun from the Bangladesh. And uh, the, the motivation behind our joint work is the, the problem of clustering. In the field of applied statistics, clustering means dividing a set of entities into groups based on mutual similarity. And the methods available so far um, mainly fall into two categories centroid based approaches model a cluster as a group of entities scattered around a common mean or common central point, whereas connectivity based approaches define um, groups, clusters as groups of entities located in high density regions and separated by near empty spaces, so to speak, between them. So for both of these methods, um, we've um, provided an example on our slide. Um, yes, and the objective that we're pursuing is to solve a problem that may arise in certain applications of the clustering procedure. Namely, that we sometimes encounter the case that the variables and the relevant data set may be of mixed type. Some of them may be continuous, like a per person's age or height, whereas others might be ordered in discrete, like credit rating grades or school grades, and still others may be discrete but unordered, like in the country, uh, case of country identifiers or sector ad identifiers in, in finance and economics. There's no natural ordering to them, and uh, they are discrete in nature. And if we have such a situation, the question arises how the pairwise distances between the individual observations or the individual entities that are part of this data set um, are going to be measured and how we separate low density from high density regions. And our approach is one possible method of dealing with this problem. So, of course, the first question we, uh, um, we have to tackle in this context is how to actually measure the pairwise distances between um, pairs of entities in such a context. And the solution we're proposing is to use different measures of distance for different types of variables. First case, if we have K1, a num limited number of continuous variables, then we can use the familiar Manhattan distance um, to calculate the pairwise distances between two points I and J. We prefer the Manhattan distance to the Euclidean distance, which is more common in many applications, because in this case, is the distances between the data points uh, doesn't shrink as rapidly as the dimension of X grows as it would do in the case of the Euclidean distance. Um, there's this paper by um, Agarwal and, and Henneburg and Keim, which has given mathematical evidence for the favorable property of the um, Manhattan distance in this particular case. When it comes to measuring distances between, just a second, between ordered discrete variables, we take a slightly different approach. Once again, if we have a natural ordering for, for, the, um, for the variables involved, we code, encode them as, as integer numbers um, ranging from one to um, a maximum number capital S. And then we take the absolute difference between the two variables involved and divide it by the total number of possible realizations um, of this variable. Um, and the underlying assumption is that the observable ordered discrete variables are um, observable counterparts of a latent variable. And um, the, that, that, that um, variable um, takes a certain value B if the latent variable falls into a bin, uh, um, which is uh, um, given as given below, 
and the distance between the mid midpoints of two neighboring subintervals, two neighboring bins, so to speak, in this ordering is equal to one over the number of possible um, realizations, which then gives rise to the normalization here, presented here. Still a different approach um, has to be used when de dealing with unordered discrete variables. Here, we take an indicator function um, which shows us whether or not the two realizations of this variable, the variable under investigation, um, differs or whether it equals. And uh, if, if, if the two realizations of the variable for two um, for a pair of observation is equal, then this this contribution to the overall distance is set to zero. If it does not equal, then it would be um, set to one over the number of possible realizations um, that this particular variable can have. What this implies is that the difference between pairs of entities um, shrinks as the number of possible um, realizations of the variable increases. And the intuition behind this is that the finer the classification scheme um, becomes, the lower the average and numbers of entities per group is going to be, and the less certain we can be that the differences between the different entities that we actually observe are simply a manifestation of random noise rather than anything systematic. Um, that um, any any systematic factor at work here. So having defined the distance measures as a, uh, as shown before, in order in order to arrive at the overall pairwise distance between two entities i and j, we simply add up these two um, variable specific distance measures to come up with a, um, a sum which then is the overall pairwise distance between entities i and j. The next step that we have to explain is the definition of the clustering, uh, description of the clustering procedure. And in order to arrive at, at this uh, point, we have to define the adjacency set of an entity. So let us assume that we have um, a limited integer number j, which is below the sample size. Um, and uh, then the first step would be to calculate for each entity in the sample, the distance between the entity itself and each of its remaining neighboring entities, so to speak, in, in the data set. And to sort the results of this calculation in an increasing order. And the, then once we have uh, performed this step, we can define for each entity, um, the adjacency set as the totality, as the set of entities, which is um, uh, for which this distance measure is less than or equal to distance from the G's closest neighbors. You will be familiar with the K nearest neighbor a method in, in non-parametric statistics. This is something very similar here. We fix a given number G and we define the adjacency set of um, observation number I as the set of all observations in the sample that are in a distance of, in a distance of less than delta I G from this particular observation. So this is how we arrive at the adjacency set. We can perform this step and we must perform this step for every entity, each and every entity in the sample. And once we've done that, we can introduce the concept of a shared neighborhood. Um, so we assume or we say that, that if we have two entities, I and J, and they are um, they are mutually interlinked um, if there is an overlap between the adjacency sets um, of these two variables. But if they are so distant from each other that the 
uh, the intersection of the adjacency set is an empty set, then we say these two entities are not mutually interlinked. And there's no linkage, so to speak, between the two, no connection between the two. Right, so once we have, um, we have uh, defined what we mean by the adjacency set, then of course um, we have to uh, come up with an algorithm or the, with a, a series of, of calculational steps by which we actually form the clusters. And the first step would be to f gather all the entities um, that we observe in the um, in the subset of so far unassigned entities. The starting point is we haven't any assigned any observation to any cluster whatsoever. Then we begin with the first cluster and we can start with a randomly chosen element uh, from, uh, from the observation set and um, identify all the, um, all the observations in the sample, um, which have not yet been assigned to a cluster, and which are, which are within the adjacency set of this first observation, which is, so to speak, the starting point of the first cluster. And all the observations that are within the adjacency set, where there's this overlap um, between the, the neighborhoods, they are assigned to the same cluster as observation one. Once this has been accomplished, we can, um, we can then search the data set um, for further observations that lie in the adjacent set of any one of the, um, any one of the um, observations assigned to cluster one so far. So we run through the observations one by one, the observations and the and the proto cluster, so to speak, um, number one, one by one, and for each of them we we test whether there's there's an overlap with the remaining observations. If there is, we assign the remaining observation to the same cluster. If there is not, we leave it out. If we do that, we will finally arrive at a point where we cannot grow the cluster number one any further then we increase the cluster number by one um, and perform the same procedure for cluster number two and so forth until, until every observation has been assigned. So the, the verbal description of the procedure here um, is in form of pseudocode is inside the paper and I'd be more than happy to provide you with uh, um, the, the slide deck if you want want me to. Um, but this is essentially how it works. And um, we've implemented the procedure and the programming language Gauss by Active Systems, this matrix programming language, um, and it's available via Google Drive. Uh, together with the data sets we're using it and the slide deck I'm presenting. I'm presenting. So hopefully you will, able, you will be able to download it. If not, please give me um, a hint so that I can provide it to you by email. So this is where, where it is located. And hopefully when you open up um, this directory, it will look like this. There's the raw data files um, in text format and the clustering procedure with a lot of comments um, uh, in the final um, .prg program file um, in the directory. So there's one question I've left out so far, and this is the question, well, how could we choose this magic number G, this number of neighboring entities by which we decide whether or not um, an observation is assigned to a cluster? And here we have a problem because if we take a, um, a very small value of G, let's say one or two, um, we'll have a situation where all the most or all the objects will be assigned to a degenerate cluster comprising only one object. And on the other hand, if we increase G2 so far, we will arrive at a situation, we will change the situation where um, 
all the observations are assigned to the same cluster, which intuitively doesn't make much sense. So we try to formalize our decision, this trade-off in, in, in the form uh, of the trade-off between two objectives, which is on one hand, we want the observations within a cluster to be as homogeneous and as close to each other as possible. And on the other hand, we want the clustering procedure overall to be inclusive so that the number of entities not assigned to a valid cluster becomes as small as possible. So um, we define a minimum cluster size. We define um, the, the index number of a classic to which object I has been assigned. And uh, we define uh, NCI, the number of objects in that cluster. And then we calculate two quantities across the entire sample. First of all, the average distance between each object and its closest neighbor within the cluster. And secondly, the average distance between each observation and its closest neighbor outside the cluster. So these two separate expressions we calculate for each and every observation in the sample. And if we say that, uh, well, we want the, the cluster to be, we want the discrepancy between the closest neighbor outside the cluster and the closest neighbor inside the cluster to be as large as possible. One of the way of, of achieving is to, is of, to, to add up the, the, um, the ratio of these two quantities across, or to, to average the ratio between these two quantities across the entire sample, um, and to, to make sure that this becomes as large as possible. So it's a trade-off between inclusiveness and um, uh, mutual similarity within the cluster. And this is one of the way, not the only way, of course, but one of the way, the way in which we could formalize this decision problem. Um, right, we first of all, in order to get an intuitive feel about how this works, um, uh, apply this procedure to a number of rather simple examples in two dimensional space with only um, continuous variables involved. There are some standard examples in the literature, and we say here that due to the um, particular nature of, um, uh, of the algorithm we are proposing, it is pretty good at separating, um, separating uh, clusters based on their density. But if there are two point clouds, so to speak, that are mutually interlinked by a thin bridge, like the, uh, the, right, the, the, the these, this meta cluster on the right-hand side of the slide, um, then our algorithm has a tendency to group such seemingly distinct clusters together, because there is a linkage between these two, um, a tiny little bridge, so to speak, that seems to connect them in the image. And the same would apply in this case to cluster number one. Intuitively, we would say, all right, th th this must be two clusters linked by a small bridge, but the very existence of this thin bridge between the two causes them to end up uh, in the same cluster. Um, Another example, this one here shows that the, the algorithm in use is pretty good at separating clusters, not perfectly, but um, separating clusters with varying densities here, like the toy data set by Jane and, and co-authors. Um, and here's another example that you may or may not like, uh, close linkages uh, or bridges between um, between seemingly distinct um, point clouds will cause them to be lumped into a common cluster. Uh, and if the distances become large, then uh, and there's no, no bridges, so to speak, between neighboring uh, point clouds, then they will end up in, in uh, distinct clusters. 
Let's look at a more, more real world example to demonstrate that this actually works in the context we have designed it for. And this is uh, an example where we have uh, a country grouping here. So we took a, a data set from the World Bank uh, for a large number, more than 100 uh, uh, countries. And we separated, we, we took a number of variables, um, the World Bank region, which is a discrete and unordered um, characteristics or, or characteristic of the country, and then a total of five continuous characteristic, which is GDP per capita, debt as percentage of GDP, um, uh, and, and current account balance and government budget balance as a percentage of GDP. So the, applying the procedure that we proposed in this context will lead us to the outcome that has been summarized here. Um, two large clusters, the orange one and the dark blue ones, um, and uh, one mini cluster being composed only of Cambodia and the Maldives, which um, Yes, which is another small cluster, cluster um, consisting only of two observations and a total of six, um, well, outliers, um, six misfits, so to speak, like Afghanistan, uh, Bhutan, Cyprus, Tunisia, and Indonesia, and Le Lebanon, which simply doesn't, which the algorithm fails to assign to a group. And of course, then the question arises, well, uh, does the the procedure um, here succeed in uh, in in forming groups that are that have really distinct statistical characteristics? And uh, we uh, and we believe it does actually. We find if we look at the descriptive statistics by the cluster and compare it to the descriptive statistics of the um, um, of the sample as a whole, that cluster number two has a significantly higher GDP per capita than both clusters number one and three. And we reject the known hypothesis that the, the, these clusters are all equal in terms of our average income per capita uh, on a 99% confidence level. Likewise, if we look at the government debt variable, we find that cluster number two um, in terms of, of uh, government debt as a percentage of GDP uh, is far below both the sample average and cluster number one. And once again, a standard test of whether or not this is equal um, led to the rejection of the null of equality um, on a 99% uh, confidence level. Uh, Evidence for differences, uh, significant differences between um, the clusters in terms of uh, current account balances and government uh, balances is slightly weaker. So we find the significance on a 95% uh, confidence level, but not as, as uh, strong as in the previous case. And more importantly, we find that two clusters differ in terms of correlation. So in cluster one, um, the uh, government, uh, government uh, debt variable and the GDP per capita are positively correlated and um, the, um, the correlate and the difference is, is significant, whereas there's no such relationship confirmed in, in cluster number two. Um, and the same, observation of uh, also applies to the current account uh, balance and, and uh, GDP per capita. Once again, significant differences in the degree of correlation between these two quantities in the, in the cluster. So first of all, we, we can say, of course, that a procedure can succeed in finding and identifying groups of uh, observations that have significant statistical difference in their, in, in their characteristics um, in a real world context. But of course, there are some unresolved problems. 
we still have the the um, the issue of the curse of dimensionality. Even in this particular context, if we use our particular data, if the numbers of variables under investigation increases, then the pairwise dis differences and the pairwise distances are going to shrink to something that's very close to zero. Uh, and this problem cannot be resolved um, by our method. And of course, the possibility that there are some some uh, variables in the data set that are simply not relevant for any grouping. This possibility is just a real world issue that cannot be resolved by this approach we are um, um, we are applying. So this is not one method fits all problem. There are some problems left uh, for which for the solution of which um, other methods will have to be applied. But for a practitioner. I hope and I, I believe to a certain extent that for a practitioner, what we have presented here could be of some use. Many thanks so far for your um, your attention to this talk. Greatly appreciate that. And I think I'd leave the remaining couple of minutes for some questions that you may have. Would that be all right with you? <laughs>